Hi, I'm Valerie Koo, and I'm so excited to be talking to Anna Q, who is a Chinese-American writer, and her memoir is Made in China, a memoir of love and labor. And it's such a powerful and profound story. Anna is a beautiful writer, and she writes about the painful relationship she has with her mother and her childhood working in the family sweatshop in New York, and how she's effectively been treated as the hired help while her step-siblings were not. Now, Anna has an MFA in creative non- nonfiction uh, and also teaches nonfiction and is a nonfiction editor. So she talks to us from her home in Brooklyn. Welcome, Anna Q. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be talking to you and to have people in Australia listen to me. I, hope I you am. Can my accent. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we have a lot of American television, so I'm so excited to be talking about your book, Made in China, A Memoir of Love and Labour. Now, I could not put this book down. I, I suspected, you know, that it would be good. I suspected that I would enjoy it, but I did not su- suspect that I literally could not put the, put, put the book down. I had to force myself to go to sleep when it was too late and the next day, I came back to it and just just read it through. So oh, wow. for listeners who may not have a copy yet, and they should, can you tell us what it's about? Sure. Thank you for asking that. So Made in China is really about arriving at a single moment, a single moment of what I would consider a betrayal, reporting my parents to the authority for putting me to work in their sweatshop. And it really centers around the aftermath of learning that the report was unfounded by child services, which means that child services came and interviewed and and assessed the situation and decided everything was as it should. And uh, sort of the impact of those two things on me and my life and sort of after what it's like to live with trauma as well. So let's put this in context because you were born in China, but that you are now living in Brooklyn. But at, at I think when you were seven, was it you you actually yes. moved over to New York or to to America mm-hmm. to start your new life with your mother and family? And it was after that then your parents put you to work in this in their factory, you know, which made clothes. Yeah. Yes. And, yes. and all of that happened, yeah. So also, yes. so, so also to give readers some context, why did you want to write this book? I think in a lot of ways I wanted to write this book because it is in some ways against the good Chinese narrative or the, the, the model myth minority in the sense that you know, I think there's a lot of good stereotypes for Asians, right? We're good at math. We're (laughs) studious. Uh, We're good hires, you know? And, And I wanted to write against that because I spent most of my life feeling like I didn't live that model myth minority and feeling like I couldn't even speak up because there was that myth. And I also think that as a child, I went through quite a bit and I needed for, for me, I began to write because I needed to be able to hear my own validation, to hear, to have a place where my story mattered since it didn't really matter in the world. And it took me about 10 years to write. So a long time I, you know, went and got my MFA in the process. There was also a lot of healing. It took a long time to write and just just to give you some background on the story, my father died uh, when I was very young. So soon after I was born. And that really caused some big changes in my life. First of all, my mother suddenly did not have the backing of a man. And she had just, you know, married and had a child. She was barely 19 at the time. And she didn't know what to do. She ended up doing, and this goes back to a lot of the the history in China as well. You know, the Great Famine had passed maybe two decades ago prior to when my mother was an adult, but, you know, class was a really big issue. Poverty was still a huge issue. And so it was 
urgent that she found an immediate solution just so that we could survive. And so one of the only options she had was to come to the United States and work in a sweatshop. And that's what she did. She ended up coming to the United States, marrying the owner of a sweatshop, who is my stepfather, and then coming back for me five years later. So what ended up happening then was I came into this family that that sort of was already arranged, right? So I came into a family that had a mother, a father, uh, you know, and two children. And I was the child of my mother's first marriage. And, you know, I come from a very conservative family. My mother just did her best to sort of give them everything. And what was sort of left over was given to me. And that was so very different from the the world that I understood to be America, the school system I was being raised in. You know, I was just a kid living in Queens and I wanted what my, my, my siblings had. I wanted what my friends had. And I just didn't really understand why I was so different from my half siblings. And, you know, the, the, My mother, of course, would tell me the reason over and over again. And she would say, I'm sorry, but your dad's dead. And therefore, this is the life that you have. And sort of that was what the cultural understanding was for me. And it wasn't until much later in my life that, you know, my mother and I just continue to have conflict and conflict because I refuse to, um, in her words, you know, know my place in the family. Mm -hmm. I was being an ingrate, right? I wasn't grateful enough. She had bought me to America and allowed me to live in this house that was not mine and to eat and live and have clothes from people, people that were not my blood relations. And so for her, I, you know, it was charity in a lot of ways. And Mm. instead of being grateful, I was fighting for more. I wanted more to an extent that she wanted, she felt like I needed to be um, punished over and over again. And it got to a point where she sent me to China and, and sent me to boarding school. I eventually had to come back because, you know, I didn't know enough Chinese to really survive eighth grade at that time. You know, I could barely understand what was being asked of me on exams, never mind respond in Chinese and simplified Mm. or complex Chinese. It was just a very difficult time period for me. And then when I came back to New York, my mother almost immediately put me to work in her sweatshop. Now the sweatshop life was not crazy to me, right? Like I had grown up in it. This Mm. is how my family was making a living. So there was a lot of complexities around that, right? So like being an employee at the sweatshop, but also being an employee because I was, uh, according to my mother, a bad child and there to learn a lesson, right? So it was complicated. And she originally sent me to work in a sweatshop so that I would learn the value of a dollar, as she put it. (laughs) And I, I did learn a lot of lessons, probably not the ones that she wanted me to. Yeah. So that's what a lot of the book is about, about writing, you know, some of the darker underbellies of what it was like to grow up in the nineties in New York, to grow up an immigrant, to have, to grow up with parents that are immigrants, to have most, most of the family on um, my mother's side came and are not as fortunate as my immediate family, because again, they didn't marry into uh, middle class, right? Mm -hmm. So they, a lot of them were illegal for a very, very long time. And so that was always something that was sort of hovering over me, right? The the gratitude, what I should be grateful for, because this is what I could have been like. This is what my life would have been like if I didn't have my stepfather, Mm -hmm. if I didn't have my mother. So it was a very complex and difficult way to grow up because here I had, you know, I, I was going to elementary school, middle school, high school. All I wanted to do was hang out with my friends, get a yes. part-time job, make some money and, you know, enjoy my childhood the way everyone else was. But I was being taught to understand my life in a way that I, that I think in some ways things would, be, would have been much different if I grew up in China, but yes. I was lucky as my mother would put it that uh, <laughs> lucky enough to grow up in America in a, you know, with decent, very decent education. I, I am, I was the first one to graduate college in, in my family, never mind graduate school. Um, you know, my mother uh, probably uh, went to sixth grade. So she won't admit it, but she went to sixth <laughs> grade. And, um, and the highest education level, uh, uh, among 
my aunts and uncles is high school. My youngest uncle went to high school, but that was pretty much mm. it. So, but then when, when, when you, do you feel that your mother, because obviously she taught, she treated your younger siblings who were the children with your stepfather. She treated your mm-hmm. younger siblings very differently to the way she treated you. And there yes. were things like, and this isn't a spoiler, it's just a, you know, something that, that it's worth mentioning this at the moment. This is a fact. Yes, yes. Is very it like true. when you were working in the sweatshop, which you did after school and, and other times, your mother mm-hmm. would leave at going home time, like six or seven or whatever, six o'clock. She would leave she would go home and you weren't allowed to go in with her in the transport she was taking. You had to stay till eight o'clock and catch the bus or the train, public transport for an Mm -hmm. hour and a half and, and arrive much later after your family had had dinner. And that's just an, just one example of how you were treated differently. Was the, were those sorts of things because your mother wanted to display to your stepfather that she recognizes how grateful she is for you being able to even live there and therefore you didn't she she wanted to show that you weren't taking anything for granted or or do you think she was just me yeah I mean I you know I don't shy away from my mother's cruelty in the book cruel (laughs) beyond necessary for sure but I do think it started from a place where what you were saying is exactly true right so when I first came to the United States I think she wanted my stepfather to think that me joining the family would not change the family dynamic would not alter the balance of the family would not sacrifice their happiness and I think when I you know, and at that time, of course, I was seven years old. I hadn't seen my mother in five years. I barely recognized her. I really didn't recognize her. All I um, recognized was like the tenor of her voice because mm. she had called every two weeks mm. for the five years. But otherwise, I, you know, I was just among strangers. And in a in a culture, again, I didn't know any English. I had to learn Mandarin before I even learned English because my stepfather mm. spoke Mandarin. So there was just a huge, huge amount of change for me. And I, I don't think, you know, my mom thought much about it at all. And she was just mm. enraged that I was not doing my best to fit in and <laughs> not making room for everyone else and instead questioning her. And it also, you weren't a rebel. Also, you weren't a rebel. Yeah, I, I don't think you know, you were a really good girl. Yeah. girl. It's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. And that's, you know, I think there's definitely some generational differences in terms of like what, you know, is expected of me versus what, what I think is right to expect from a child. And yeah, it's, it is a complex story. So I think it didn't start there, but you know, mm. it, got more and more complicated. So at yeah. one point, my mother didn't want, or for most of my childhood, my mother didn't want people to know I was her daughter. Because <laughs> having been married before is not a great look for mm-hmm. her. And so there's a lot of shame around that. There was shame that was both um, intrinsic and external, meaning my stepfather's family also put some pressure on her in terms of you know whether or not it was right for her to bring me to family, Mm. you know, family gatherings. Or go on holidays together. Mm -hmm. You'd be left behind. Oh my God. So (laughs) writing is a very healing process. And you mentioned Mm -hmm. that you went through a lot of healing and that it took 10 years to write. When you first started writing this, did you intend for this to be a published book? No, I think I spent a lot of time writing it just for myself. And I I would say I could have probably published the book earlier, but I don't think I would have had the distance perspective or empathy um, that I hope comes across in the book. I think I, you know, I had to work through a lot of anger and a lot of just sort of my own memories to, and to really retell the story from an adult's perspective. So there was a lot of sort of trying to figure out, you know, whose fault is it? And sometimes it was society's fault. A lot of the times it was society's fault, right? Mm, And I mean, I don't think my mother intentionally wanted 
the worst relationship with her daughter. But of course, that's suddenly where we were because she had certain pressures and I had certain pressures. And then we were in a room and all we did was fight and we continued Mm -hmm. to fight, meaning, Mm -hmm. you know, we're still in that place now. Yeah. And it's really, you know, I think in some ways it's really about sacrifice and what sacrifice is necessary for her. I think in some ways she made the decision that I was a sacrifice that she was willing to make to Mm, make a better mm. life for all of us. So Um, when, when you were at school, did you, when when did you want to become a writer? I think I've always wanted to be a writer. I'm actually in the process of moving now and I found some really awful poetry from high school. Oh my God. I was so embarrassed. I showed my um, my partner, and we were both like red faced, like, "Oh, this is so uncomfortable." <laughs> so, um, looking back, yeah, since I mean, since those terrible poems were <laughs> written, I would say, you know, soon after, I- I've always loved books. I've always loved readings. I've always had like, you know, a love relationship with libraries. They were yeah. my favorite books were my escape I would Mm. you know you know you asked how I I had made it through my childhood a lot of it was you know with my nose in a book on those Mm. train rides or bus rides or walks or whatever it is and so that's always been a huge part of my life and so I it was difficult to face because as you know I was raised really conservatively to think about money, especially considering the upbringing that I had very concerned about supporting myself. I left home when I was 17. So um, I've been supporting myself since then. So at this point, I've been supporting myself a lot longer than I haven't been supporting myself. So but uh, I feel very, very fortunate. Actually, in the last uh, since the book was published, I have transitioned fully to teaching, which is something I've really wanted to do, but I've always- And maybe just, can you tell listeners what you teach? Sure. I teach creative writing, mostly in MFA programs or MA programs. I teach workshop, nonfiction workshop. I talk about transgenerational trauma, trauma of all different kinds. I also love to talk about how um, we need to include more of ourselves when we're talking about the healing process and writing. And I wouldn't say that writing a book is cathartic, and I don't think the, the finished product is meant to be cathartic, but I do think that there is healing that comes from writing. There is healing that comes from, for example, publishing a book, right? So I feel like there's been a huge healing process in just having this book out there, having someone like you read it. You know, before I published the book, maybe four or five people in my entire life knew the entire story. So not a lot of people at all. And now it just feels like, oh, I don't have this huge part of my life hidden because it was hidden for so long. And it was hidden because people didn't want to hear it. It was hidden because people didn't want to see it. It was hidden because people, you know, were too busy for it. And now, now when I don't need other people, I can put it in a book and have other, and have just people read it. Um, And also, also, because there are so many expectations of filial piety and respect and all of those things, which are completely valid, Mm -hmm. of course, in, you know, certain situations, combined with the Hollywood fairy tale of, you know, eventually mothers and daughters figure out their differences and all of that, stories like this don't necessarily you get told a lot because, mm-hmm. as you say, people don't necessarily want to hear it or or it gets brushed aside like, oh, yeah. it'll all get worked out. Thank you for writing this book, I Thank have to you say. So much I just think that it is going to speak to so many people, Thank regardless you. of what culture they're, they're from, but I think it's going to speak to so many people who don't necessarily have that fairy tale mm-hmm. relationship. But let's come back to the actual writing. You started writing it initially for yourself. At what point do you think this, I'm going to make this a proper, I'm going to make this a book? 
like one that's going to get published. <laughs> I'm going to yeah, go to a publisher. I, mean, I would say after I got my MFA, so this Made in China was one of the short stories or uh, essays in the collection that was my thesis at the time. And it felt the most tangible in terms of like sort of explaining the whole dynamic of my family. And that's why I chose it. And it, it just took, I would say it really took two years for me to feel like that it could be a book. And then, you know, then I spent four more years working on it and not really showing anyone by this time, but it was bought and sold very quickly. So I, I pitched my agent and she picked me up really fast. And then we worked on the book for about eight months and then she sent it out and it was picked up in like three weeks, which wow. was very fast in publishing. Did you send out um, the completed manuscript? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. So when you think of, because when you're just writing for healing purposes, you're writing whatever, right? You're not necessarily yeah. thinking yeah. of a narrative thread. You're not necessarily thinking of a structure. Mm-hmm. How did you determine what period of your life this was going to work, that, that where this story was going to work and fit into a structure that was going to be satisfying to readers? I would say the hardest thing about this book or any any book you write is the structure for me mm. um, now and probably forever, I would say. Uh, you know, for example, the beginning of this book was the last thing to, to be complete. It was oh. probably written four months before the book came out. Really? And I think, yeah. And I think that is pretty standard in the sense that you really have to write to the end mm. before you know if you have a book or not. Right. So, and then you kind of go back to the front and it's like, okay, now that I've written the whole book, how do I want this book to start? But you can't just start a book and expect it to be the one draft that makes it. I would say my book probably went through nine really big rounds of rewrites, three on my own, and then a couple of times with my agent, and then a couple of times with my editor. Mm. And so, so yeah, you sort of like, you know, it, it's an unwieldy huge project when you start and then by the end it just feels like a few pages <laughs> and because it just you know you've been working with it for so long mm. did you yeah. instinctively know where you were going to end your end point because your I end point is not in your life now it's not present day it, where your end yes. point is you know earlier mm. Yeah, the end point actually when the end point happened and for those no things, spoilers. <laughs> no, don't do it. Okay. I should probably should have asked a question in a different way. I would say when the ending happened, I knew. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I would say, yeah, and this is a com- the common problem writing memoir. You sort of keep writing and keep writing and suddenly it's like later and later mm-hmm. in your life. Mm-hmm. And that really did happen um okay. for a few years until something happened and I knew that was gonna be the end of the book. So when you are writing memoir, you are laying out a lot of your life, mm-hmm. a lot of your feelings. It's it's really bearing, in some cases, it's bearing your soul. In some cases, it's bearing, bearing very private events. Was that hard <laughs> or, or were you very, just? very, very hard. Uh-huh. I would say it was very, very hard. I think even in the writing of the book, it was very traumatizing. I mean, it wasn't as traumatizing as living through it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but because it is, it's narrative nonfiction, so it's written like a story. I had to relive every one of those scenes, you know, dozens and dozens of times. And sometimes I would have to walk away and go do something else because it was just so intense. So for example, I picked up painting when I was working on some of the hardest parts because I I wanted to be creative, but I just could not work on the book. And so it just felt like um, a creative process. Again, it was about, you know, what I was seeing and what I was recreating, right? So it was a similar reflection, but it was just, I had no attachment to it the way that I'm so attached to this book. And I really wanted to tell it in a way that was right, quote unquote right, even though there's no such thing. Mm-hmm. But there's just so much at stake with a memoir. But so at any point, did you go, oh, I'm not going to write. I'm not going to include that. 
because it was too hard, too private or too Yeah, yeah, yeah. I talk to my students a lot about cannibalizing your story and just holding things back for yourself. And I would say that, you know, I did really lay it out there and I wanted that challenge. I challenged myself, especially, you know, if I ever felt there was a moment of shame or anything bought me shame, I would write into it instead of pull away from it. Because I do think that if you're going to take on the work of writing nonfiction, you might as well do it 120% if you're going to have to pay for it anyway. (laughs) So, um, yeah. Uh, So so that's sort of my... my take of it. But I would say, yeah, there are things that did not make it into the book that I felt like I wasn't ready or wasn't my story to tell. And, you know, every memoir is sort of our own version of it. So it isn't, you know, the ultimate truth and it isn't the only truth, but I would say it's my truth. Um, Mm. And, you know, it, it's, it's, as you've been sort of touching on, it is very hard to air dirty laundry sort of Uh, your family will um, be very, very angry. And if they haven't already, will most likely disown you. So that is a real thing. What Um, is your relationship like with now that this book has come out, out, has your mother read the book and expressed any, you know, thoughts on it? uh, I don't think my mother uh, will ever read the book. And I think even if she did, she would not see the empathy and the attempts I've made in giving her a a full character. So I don't think that there's anything that I, or yeah, there's, there's no way. Mm -hmm. And I don't, (laughs) and I would say our relationship has gotten worse since the publication of the book, which I didn't think was possible. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. And that's surprising. Now, with uh, you're also an essayist. You you do focus a lot on nonfiction. You teach nonfiction. Do you also write fiction? I haven't, but I feel like now I can. So Whoa, I'm really right. excited. Yeah, I'm really excited. Nice. I feel like such a sense of freedom now in the sense that, you know, a memoir is like a vocation. It felt like I, once I had, you know, once I had committed to the story, I felt like I had to just get it out there and put, put it out there. And I sort of couldn't couldn't be done until this book was out there. Now that it is out there, it's just been an incredible experience being freed from it in some ways. And yeah, I would love to write a novel now. (laughs) Great. Now when you were, (laughs) just to what, sorry? Just to, just to give myself an emotional break. (laughs) Yeah, I get it. I get it. So when you decided to actually make this a manuscript for publication and work on it, was it, just take me through the, what was going on in your life at the time. I just mean, in terms of where you spent your time, did you focus on it a hundred percent or were you doing it in between other jobs? How did you I actually get it had, done? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I've always had a day job. I've probably been an office manager, like seven or eight times, not even years, seven or eight times. I've been an assistant probably an equal amount of time. You know, I've worked uh, at Sears. I don't know if you guys have Sears there. <laughs> <laughs> like David um, Jones. It's, yeah. 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 <laughs> I've worked, you know, at many restaurants. I've, yeah, I've, I've had so many, so many jobs. And at no point did I really have the freedom to work on the book by itself. So I've always had a job. This so did you first- carve out specific times to work on it? Like, how did you fit it in? I woke up every morning at six and I would bang my head against the wall. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And on the weekends, I would try very hard to commit like five hours each day to it. So like a large chunk of the morning or a large chunk of the afternoon. That's that's how it got done. Oh, great. I mean, yeah, good work ethic. (laughs) (laughs) So now that this has come out, What has been the response from people and has it been what you've expected? This response has been, uh, it's actually, I would say it's been a really, really difficult time having the book out there or sort of the waiting period around figuring out how well your book is going to (laughs) do. I have to say, like, I, I didn't think 
it would be such a, but of course it was right. So, I mean, I began writing the book because I wanted validation and, Mm -hmm. you know, no matter how far you get away from that 10 years later, you still like, Oh my God, I hope people recognize that this is, you know, a good book that it's good writing and that my life, you know, like I've done something. So that was really, really hard and just sort of waiting for the book to come out. So when the Mm -hmm. book was signed to when the book actually came out was two Mm -hmm. years. Oh my. And Mm -hmm. I spent most of it in the pandemic, which means I was by Mm -hmm. myself and with all of the inside of my brain doing its thing. (laughs) (laughs) So yes, I would say that was actually one of the most challenging parts of it. And I would say what was really helpful to me during that time in terms of stability was that I had a partner that was able to ground me. And I think that was actually a much in hindsight, I think it, was, it made a huge impact. Mm. Um, but, but now that it has come out, what, what's been the response? And have you had a lot of feedback or, you know? Yes. All of the reviews have been really fantastic. I have people reach out to me all the time. It's just been received really, really well. The, the sales, I think, are also looking really strong. So mm-hmm. I'm really excited. Uh, Catapult, which is my publisher in, in, in the States, is looking to change the cover to uh, when when it comes on paperback this the this year. I think it'll come out in August. There'll be a different paperback cover, so we're hoping that also boosts sales even more. Yeah. But yeah, it's been an interesting experience. Wow. All sure. right. Well, I think it's absolutely fantastic. Finally, what if you had to give your top three tips? to aspiring writers and let's focus on memoir because that's exactly what you've written to people who want to publish their memoir one day what would those top three tips be I would say take your time be kind to yourself writing the book is all there is that is the entire journey and there don't worry about the destination and regardless of whether it gets published or not you know it is uh, it can be your life's work and Uh, just because it isn't published doesn't mean that it's not worth writing or that you're not going to come out the other end a better. The other thing I would say is to have community in terms of, you know, not just, you know, a a writing group or someone to look at your feedback, but also someone to talk about how hard it is to write a book. It's (laughs) so, so hard. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of time alone. And sometimes, you know, I have friends I just call and I just, you know, complain for an hour. <laughs> we don't even, we're, you know, we're not even getting to the writing yet. We're just complaining. And that just clears the air for more writing, right? It mm. re-energizes you. So I would say community, just be really, have a few really good friends, figure out, you know, what it is that you need as a writer. Is it, mm. you know, a community to go and have drinks with? Is it someone to sit on the couch with and just cry with? Is it, you know, someone to take feedback with? Sort of figure out what it is that you need and, mm. and get that from your community. And I would say the last advice is always to be kind to yourself. We're so, so cutting of ourselves. And, and, and you know, because it is a long process, you really have to be patient with yourself. You have to figure out ways to nurture your your inner writer or else that writer will not come to fruition. So uh, I would say kindness more than cruelty. <laughs> Wonderful. On And on that note, everyone needs to get a copy of Made in China by Anna Q. Absolutely yes. loved so reading this. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today, Anna. Valerie, thank you. This has been such a pleasure.